Shalom, Chabrim. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. I have a very interesting message I wanted to share with you guys here uh, today. More and more, especially as we think about our, our trip that we'll be having in uh, Israel next month, March 28th. Definitely, if you would like to be a part of that, we're still a good ways away from having all the costs covered on this event. Uh, we have a number of speakers that will be speaking there, including Rabbi Yehuda Glick. He will also be speaking at this event here. We are looking to bridge that gap with our Jewish brothers uh, and sisters there and also to share with them the dangers uh, that they are facing with Rome and just how they're trying to bring about a false millennial reign inside of Israel. So we do have a very interesting audience that will be listening and you can be a major part in helping this happen. I'll be sharing that with you guys. Some of it will be possibly aired live on Israeli News Live on our, um, on our live stream account. So if you've not registered on there, check out Israeli News Live live stream and get on with that there so that you can be watching this as well. Uh, getting right into this message, though, oh, by the way, you can go to IsraelReturns.com or IsraeliNewsLive.org if you'd like to contribute online. Also, at the end of the broadcast, we'll have our address. It'll appear here as well. Uh, but getting, getting into this right here, we know Scripture has uh, compound fulfillments. Many times in biblical passages we see that, such as Yeshua fulfilling, Out of Egypt I called my son, also applying to Israel when Moses and Aaron, along with Miriam, led the children of Israel out of Egypt as well. Uh, there can be more than just two fulfillments and prophecies, or more than one way that a prophecy could have a fulfillment. As we saw here in the case of Obadiah chapter 1 verse 16, For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. This clearly we saw fulfilled in 2014 by the Pope of Rome when he brought men only, which is masculine plural, showing that it was men only that were drinking upon the God's holy mountain, Mount Zion, right there inside of uh, uh, the upper room above King David's tomb. Uh, and especially when it goes on to say, which is now gender inclusive, all the Gentiles will drink continually upon, again, God's holy mountain. All right, the Pope of Rome fulfilled this, but there's something that maybe we haven't looked at before. All right, if we come down here, but in Mount Zion there shall be those that escape, and it shall be holy, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. What is that all about? Well, think about it like this here. Uvacha Zion. This is the focus I want to look at with you today. Uva Chatzion, or Chatzion. Chatzion is the Mount Zion, or the mountain of Zion. All right, Mount Zion, 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 which is also the very term used for the word sheep in Hebrew. All right, so it's also a dwelling place. And that's something I want you to think about as we continue on in here. We're going to go up and down here in Obadiah real quick here. But anyway, also, we find that the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And you have to wonder, what possessions are they going to possess? Yet, it's on Mount Zion. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. Now, the house of Esau, modern day speaking, as far as a technical uh, peoples or group, is none other than Rome itself. It is the Vatican. But also, Mount Esau represents something totally different, just like Mount uh, Zion also has a compound fulfillment and a compound meaning. Notice in verse, uh, as we move on down here, and they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall be uh, not to be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. And they of the, of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, and they of the lowland, the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim and Samaria and Benjamin, and possess Gilead. And the captivity of, <clears throat> of this host of the children of Israel that are among the Canaanites, even to Zarephath, even the captivity of Jerusalem, that is, Sepharad, shall possess the cities of the south, and saviors, or we could say deliverers, Moshim, 
all right, shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Now, we realize this is also speaking of the two witnesses. It is in the plural. It is very obvious as speaking of the two witnesses. And deliverers shall come up on <clears throat> Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Now, I shared with you a little while back how that this represents the two witnesses coming up on Mount Zion and judging Rome for the evils that they have done, because why? They have turned Mount Zion into Mount Esau. Effectively, we saw this when the Israeli government allowed the Pope of Rome an official seat there on Mount Zion, he effectively turned Mount Zion into the Mount of Esau. But it also has a spiritual significance, and this is what I want to share with you. Now, we're going to come back to Obadiah in just a moment, but let's jump over here to Psalm 74 here. I want to share with you some interesting words here from the psalmist in the 74th chapter. It says, Why, O God, hast thou cast us off forever? Why does thine anger smoke against the flock of thy pasture? Notice that. The flock of your pasture. Betzaon. Again. All right. There's your flock. There, or, you know, in the sheep of your pasture. All right, the ro'e, ro'e ro right here. This, this is your root word right there for the shepherd there. Okay, the shepherd of the sheep right here. But this is, you know, why is your anger against the flock of your pasture? Remember your congregation, using modern English for you here. Remember your congregation which you, um, we'll just use it, which thou hast gotten of old which thou hast redeemed to be the tribe of thine inheritance, and Mount Zion, wherein thou hast dwelt. Hmm, interesting. Now, I want to show you something here, very interesting. We're going to back up. Let me look with it. Which thou hast gotten of all, which thou hast redeemed to be the tribe of thine inheritance. All right, so remember thy congregation, which thou hast gotten of old, which thou hast redeemed to be the tribe of thine inheritance. Now, then they put on here, and Mount Zion. It doesn't say, and Mount Zion in Hebrew. It just says, Mount Zion, wherein thou dwellest, or thou, thou dwelt. Okay? Ze shachanatat bo. All right? So that's literally where the Almighty dwelled, was where? Mount Zion. But he's referring to it, not and Mount Zion. See, the, the, the translators, it's interesting, they put and Mount Zion there as if the temple, because see, the temple set on Mount Zion, or as people say today, Mount Moriah. It's really the same mountain. The whole area there is Mount Zion that, 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 that the old city is sitting on. All right? But what has happened here, though, is the fact that God, notice, rem remember thy congregation, which thou hast gotten of old, which thou hast redeemed to be the tribe of thine inheritance, Mount Zion, where thou hast dwelled. Take the word and out. It's not in Hebrew whatsoever. What is it? You are the temple of Almighty God. And right here in the psalm, the psalmist David is showing this as well, that you are that temple. All right? Lift up thy steps because the perpetual ruins, even all the evil that the enemy hath done in the sanctuary. Thine adversaries have roared in the midst of thy meeting place. They have set up their own signs for signs. All right? Now, but I want you to notice that Mount Zion, this is where God dwells himself. Now, besides Psalm 74, let me also take you to Psalm 78. Just want to jump over there real quick because I want you to be able to see this as well. Psalm 78, and we're going to go all the way, jump all the way down to... to Verse 68 right here. Maybe I have to back a little, a little bit different there. All right. Uh, let's start with verse 66. And he smote his adversaries backwards. He put upon them a perpetual uh, reproach. Moreover, he abhorred uh, the tent of Joseph and chose not the tribe of Ephraim. Keep that in mind there. He abhorred the tent of Joseph and chose not the tribe of Ephraim but chose the tribe of Judah, the Mount Zion, which he loved. That is a clear prophecy of the coming of Yeshua. 
He had whored the tent of Joseph and chose not the tribe of Ephraim, but chose the tribe of Judah. And what tribe did Yeshua come from? The tribe of Judah. And he calls it what? Et Hatzion. The, in other words, the true mountain of Zion. And he built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth which he had founded forever. He wasn't talking about the building. He wasn't talking about in Jerusalem, the first or the second temple. He is literally prophesying of the coming of the Mashiach right here. All right. He chose David also his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the ewes that give suck, he brought him to be a shepherd over Jacob, his people, and Israel and his inheritance. So Mount Zion is the temple. Mount Zion is, you are, you have become Mount Zion. And that true son of David delights in dwelling in you, the true Mount Zion. And what's interesting, if you look about it, it makes more sense. When I began to look at Obadiah, um, there was one other one here. Let me just see if I missed it here. Okay. If we go back to Obadiah, this is what kind of threw me. Because as I mentioned, you have Mount es the Mount of Esau, Mount Zion become the Mount of Esau. And again, in the, in the, in the natural, I saw that with the Pope of Rome doing the drinking on, the whole, on God's holy mountain, Mount Zion, you know, in, in, the, in the natural, and the fact that they allowed the Pope of Rome the official seat at King David's tomb, officially turning the Mount Zion into uh, the Mount of Esau. But here's one that threw me, though. If you look at verse 8 in Obadiah, it says, Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and discernment out of the Mount of Esau? All right, now, then it goes to verse 9. And thy mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end everyone, excuse me, everyone may be cut off from the Mount of Esau by slaughter. Now, then it began to come together. Then it began to make sense. You are the temple of God. You are Mount Esau where God delights to dwell. But think of it today. Look over in Rome, Italy right now. The head church that all, even many of the denominations have already come back up underneath the mother church of Rome right now. Look at all the churches. Look at the evangelical movements, the Pentecostals, the Baptists, all of them that have joined in with mother Rome. Esau's children. Okay. Even in Obadiah, is showing you that. Showing you they come home to their mother. But notice what God says. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord. Now, the word destroy here, you could use that word for the Hebrew word there. But I don't think it is a good choice. It's actually, it is one that has wandered away. And it's not so much, shall I not in that day, but rather God is saying, Halo uh, beyom chahu. He's saying, lo, in, the, in this day, says the Lord, shall the wise men of Edom wander away and discernment out of the Mount Esau. In other words, their wisdom to know how to lead the, lead the children of God is totally gone. They have no wisdom, no discernment whatsoever. Why? Because they're, they're not Mount Sion, they're not the tabernacle in which God chooses to, to dwell in. Instead, they are Mount Esau where man chooses to rule. And as a result, that soul is totally being corrupted with an ungodly diet. A spiritual food that is not from the Holy Spirit. And therefore, they are dying as a result.
It's not that God has to destroy the wise men out of Edom, but it's rather the wise men of Edom have wandered away in the discernment of Mount, Seol, uh, Mount uh, Esau. It's, it's just gone. There's no discernment. Because why? They don't have the Holy Spirit living within them. They are not Mount Zion. They are not the congregation of the Lord. They are not filled with the Spirit of Yeshua as we see that this is the way God chose it when we were looking at Psalm 74. We can go back real quick over there to see that. In Psalm 74, clearly, remember thy congregation which thou hast gotten of all which thou hast redeemed to be the tribe of thine inheritance and Mount Zion, uh, Zion where, wherein thou hast dwelt. Lift up thy steps because of the perpetual ruins, even the evil that the enemy hath done in the sanctuary. Now, notice that right there. See, God chooses Mount Zion, but watch what verse 3 says in Psalm 74. Lift up thy steps because of the perpetual ruins, even all the evil that the enemy hath done in the sanctuary. Thine adversaries have roared in the midst of thy meeting place. They have set up their own signs for signs. And that's what the Pope of Rome has done. That is what every Pope of Rome has done. That is what the churches have done. They have gotten away from the true word of God and they have perverted the true Mount Zion where the Holy Spirit was to dwell inside of you. You are Mount Zion. You are the temple of Almighty God. And when you allow these false doctrines to feed your soul, when you feed upon that false doctrines that are going on, you, your soul is being corrupted. Let thy steps because the perpetual ruins, even, even all the evil that the enemy hath done in the sanctuary. Thine adversaries have roared in the midst of thy meeting place. They have set up their own signs for signs. It seemed as when men... Uh, wilt upward axes in a thicket of trees and now all the carved work thereof together they strike down with a hatchet and hammers. They have set thy sanctuary on the fire and they have profaned the dwelling place of thy name even to the ground. And that's both natural and spiritual. Now notice that they have set thy sanctuary on fire. Who was it that burned down the second temple in the natural? It was Rome under the command of Titus, a Roman general. Sure, he had the help of the Syrian uh, army. Why not? The Romans had conquered Syria. Isn't it kind of odd that the Rome is conquering Syria today? Now, people might say, it wasn't Rome that's conquering Syria. That was under the Obama administration. They funded all of these jihadists that went in there through the Saudis, the Qataris, and, 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 and the Jordanians. You remember the other day the pictures I showed to you on Israeli News Live, those that you watch Israeli News Live, where I showed you all those nations. And these are the very nations that, by the way, Prime Minister Netanyahu and that of President Donald Trump were saying that they're working together for a new, a new, what is it, a one-state solution with a much bigger, bigger deal, as Donald Trump calls it. And we find out that those nations that they were talking about that are going to be the, the neighbors that are going to work together with Israel happen to be Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Jordan, Egypt, all these Arab nations that are all, every one of them, in bed with the Pope of Rome. And as I said, you don't believe that the Pope isn't calling the shots in Syria? Then you tell me then why was it Bashar al-Assad sent to the Pope of Rome back, I think it was in 2013 or 2014, what conditions he would sign an agreement of surrender. Hmm. The Pope of Rome has that much influence over Bashar al-Assad and what was happening in his country? He knows that the Pope of Rome was the only one that could bring an end to it. So, and now all the carved work thereof together, they strike down, watch it. They have set thy sanctuary on fire. So yes, the Titus, the Roman general, burnt down the church. And not only that, in the spiritual, if you did not agree later, 325 AD, under Constantine, when they first decided to make the first uh, Christian church, Christian people were doing just fine without Constantine getting his big nose involved in it. We did not need Constantine's help. We had written documents by, by the apostles. They had written documents. We already had the, the Torah. We had the Tanakh. We had, the, in other words, the Jewish Bible, even the Septuagint, you could say. So we had the Old Testament already coming down as it was. We had all of that. And we had the writings of the apostles. 
And then suddenly, in 325 at Nicaea, Rome, Constantine had to get his big nose into it and turn around and make an organized church where the state could control what the church had to say. What happened then? They set thy sanctuary on fire. The soul, the true Mount Zion, they burn it to the ground. They have profaned the dwelling place of thy name even to the ground. And you are that temple. They said in their heart, let us make havoc of them altogether. They have burned up all the meeting places of God in the land. And Rome put how many people to the stake and burned them as witches? Righteous, holy people. Went through northern Africa. Killed as many of the believers of Yeshua as they could. Any Jew they could find that was a believer of Yeshua, they made sure they killed him. And then they, that's, that's how they got this new thing going on with Islam, created Islam in order to track them down and kill them all as well. Didn't know that, did you? That's what was going on. And so we look over here at Obadiah. And Obadiah says, And thy mighty men of Teman shall be dismayed to the end. Everyone may be cut off from the mount of Esau by slaughter. It's not that God is going to send in a bunch of people and kill them. It's their own deeds. Really, when you look at this in the Hebrew right here, Mikatel, what, what is it saying here? What was Esau? Esau was a hunter. Jacob, he was the good boy that stayed there with mama. He was like a farmer planting the crop. The Bible says, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. Is that right? Mount Esau has lived by the sword, conquering the people, destroying souls, conquering Mount Zion. And as they have conquered Mount Zion in the spiritual, or in the natural, I should say, they have conquered them over the years. No, that's spiritual. Spiritual is correct trying to destroy the soul by putting in false doctrines into the people and bringing about Jesuit back all kinds of religions. The Jesuits have infiltrated every denomination there is under the sun. I don't care which one it is. And what they do? They started bringing them back to mama here in the last days. And so as they have conquered Mount Zion in the spiritual, they've also conquered it in the natural. But there will be deliverance. And that's what I love. There is deliverance. And Savior shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. They're going to come up on Mount Zion. What is that? A restoration for the soul. The two witnesses come up to bring back that true word of God and the soul of the children of Israel. You know, me and my wife, we were talking about the 144,000 this morning. Do you realize that 12,000 from each tribe, and yet in Israel there's only three tribes, maybe a fourth one or something like that here and there, but for the most part, they're only, it's only the house of Judah, the house of Levi, and the house of Benjamin, and, and the Samaritans that are living in Israel today. So what do you think is going to happen when the two witnesses come? What do you think these 144,000 are going to do? They're going to wake up. It's going to be a global wake up. The Hebrews are globally will wake up. I trust it's been a blessing to you, this little message today. And don't forget, we do need your help in this trip going over to Israel. Again, we have, we're still a little bit short, quite a, actually quite a bit short on the cost, of covering the cost. Um, but we, and also I'll post in here for you the actual link to the broadcast or to, or to the uh, meeting inside the comments below so you can check it out for yourself. You'll see quite a few speakers that will be speaking there uh, as well. Yano too will be speaking at this particular uh, meeting and I'm sure it'll be a blessing. So if you are able to come to Israel, It'll definitely be a, a blessing indeed. And of course, it is on Mount Zion, right outside Zion's gate there, uh, near the tomb of David, a very beautiful place there that uh, by God's grace we were able to get. So we hope that you can come. Uh, definitely go to the website that'll be in the link below. 
and, um, and, and register. I'll put a little note on there, uh, conference, Israeli conference, so that way you can go on there, you can actually go and register. There's already people starting to register. We do have limited seating, so we do need to know if you're gonna be coming. Uh, we'll be meeting there with the Jewish population as well, so there'll be people from all sides coming to this meeting. I'm Stephen Benin, you're watching the Institute of Biblical Research. Shalom.